Hello folks! Welcome to the Poly Champions YouTube. We have another strategy guide for you, this time for IMO. This guide will focus on the three things that make IMO different. The Altar of Peace monument, the tribe's easy access to the philosophy tech, and of course, mind benders. Okay, let's learn how to play IMO. First, let's talk about the pacifist monument. As long as you do not attack an opponent, Imo will get the monument on turn five. You wanna place the monument in the city that has the best chance of getting a giant later. Usually that's your capital cause you're more likely to get population on your capital from lighthouses, a lucky population ruin, or from road or port connections later in the game. If another city has a better chance of giving you a giant fast, then put the monument in one of those other cities. Giants are slow. If you can get one quickly on the border with your opponent, that's ideal. With the Altar of Peace, you only need eight population to get that first giant. Let's look at this example. Imo Capital has four resources. Without roads, ports, or lucky finds like a lighthouse or population ruins, it's unlikely to get a giant there anytime soon. The eastern city has seven population, not enough to get a giant without a port. The middle city, though, has eight population. That's enough to get a giant with the Altar of Peace. The player decides to take an explorer in that city to get vision on his opponent. Imo sees that there are enough resources in the surroundings for him to get a second giant with border growth. In addition, getting border growth steals some terrain from the city that the Umaji rider will get first and prevents Umaji from placing and using roads close to his cities. So that's what Imo does. He gets two giants in that middle city, thanks to the altar of peace. Let's look at another example. Here, Imo has lots of resources around the capital. He gets climbing for the ruin and vision on the lighthouse. When we count up all the resources, the capital has 15 population, including the lighthouse. If you chop one forest and place a forge later, that gets the capital up to 20 population, enough for a second giant. He doesn't need to put the monument in the capital, that would be overkill. Instead, he places the monument under Western City, which allows him to upgrade to a level three city later. If you are attacked and your unit defends itself, the retaliation attack does not count against the pacifist monument. So even if an enemy attacks you before turn five, you can still get the altar of peace. There are games like tiny maps or crowded free-for-alls where you might want to attack early and sacrifice the altar of peace. Here, the host in Teal makes a calculated risk to attack because he has another warrior coming and he believes he can take that city. Turns out his opponent in beige has a rider. He also feels it's worth attacking to save his city. They both give up the pacifist monument because they both want that city. Here's another example from a tiny map game. The host in teal attacks because he has another warrior nearby and can take that middle city if brown claims the village. However, brown makes a mistake. He attacks losing both the chance at the monument and a village in the middle. Even though he couldn't keep that city in the middle, the monument would have helped to upgrade his capital. Next, let's talk about the philosophy tech. Philosophy comes after meditation in the tech tree and gives you a 33% discount on all future tech costs. When and if to get philosophy comes down to the resources around your capital, the map size, and how fast you might meet an opponent. Here's a classic philosophy rush example. Start by getting a second warrior. Move your warrior towards resources indicating a village. When I move on to the village, I realize I do not have parallel resources. That means matching resources in the capital and other cities so you can upgrade both with the same tech. I have two animals around my capital and only one animal in my second city. Also, this is a water map, so I'll probably need a navy. I can't tell if there's a second fruit or more animal around the second village. So I go for philosophy before capturing the first village. I capture the first village and continue exploring. 
On turn 5, I complete the pacifist task and get the monument. I get a tech, upgrade one city, usually that's the capital, and place the Altar of Peace monument to get 5 stars back. I use those stars to upgrade another city. You might use it to get a tech. Here, I should have bought Org before capturing that village, as tech costs go up with each new city. Classic Philosophy Rush works better for larger maps or water-heavy maps where you do not have parallel resources in your capital and other villages. So get Philosophy before capturing your first city. This gives you 7 stars per turn at the end of T5 and that 33% discount on all future tech costs. On small or tiny land-based maps where you might meet an opponent early, or if you're fortunate to get a spawn with at least two of the same resources in all your starting cities, not getting philosophy works well. In this example, I see that all my cities have fruit. I only need organization to upgrade them all. On turn three, I get org before capturing my first village, then I get a workshop. Turn four, I upgrade and get another workshop. Then on turn five, I place the Altar of Peace monument, get 5 stars back, and upgrade to get another workshop. This example maximizes your income, but you should consider getting an explorer in your second or third city. If you take workshops in all your cities, this gives you 11 stars per turn at the end of T5. Next, let's talk about getting philosophy after you place your monument. We'll call this philosophy for 13 stars. This works better if you have parallel resources either in your capital and another city or the first two villages you find. Here I have fruit around both of my two villages. On turn three, I have nine stars. That's enough to get one tech and upgrade a city for a workshop. The next turn, I move my warrior to keep exploring. I capture and upgrade to get another workshop. On turn five, I complete the pacifist task and place the monument. In some scenarios, you may want to place the monument in your capital for a workshop or in another city for five stars back. Now, I can afford to get philosophy for 13 stars. But why philosophy at 13 stars? So, Philosophy will cost 13 for a few turns because you usually capture your first two cities fast with those two starting warriors, and the fourth city comes later. All this time between when you only have those three cities total, philosophy remains at 13 stars. The difference between paying 13 stars versus 7 stars earlier before capturing your first village is 6. Since you've invested in a tech, some of those stars already paid off and are earning a return, so the difference is lower. For the price of a few stars, philosophy becomes a good option later to help with expensive tier 2 and tier 3 texts. Waiting until philosophy costs 13 stars also keeps your options open. If you meet an opponent early and you've already spent seven stars on philosophy, that's money gone towards reducing tech costs when what you probably need is more units. In this game, I rushed philosophy and then got org later. But this is a small map. I should have expected to meet my opponent early. Then on turn six, I get attacked. My opponent already has writers. I invested in philosophy when I could have used those stars to get units. Spawning in the corner gets you one free population from a lighthouse. In this scenario, you do not want to wait for philosophy. Take advantage of that free population. Get a second warrior to explore and look for villages. Get a tech on turn two and then the workshop in your capital. You might be tempted to get a workshop on turn one with a single tech and only a single warrior, but this is not the best choice for the long run. Even in an optimal lighthouse situation where you have parallel resources and can upgrade cities with one starting tech, getting the workshop on turn one is only a two-star advantage versus getting that second warrior. 
it's better to get the second warrior to explore and find villages. And now, a word from our sponsor. Are you feeling stressed? Pressured? Conflicted? Come to IMO and find inner peace. Mindbenders can give you a fresh start. Experience spicy cuisine, adorable llamas, and transcendent views. The Altar of Peace provides population and score. Use code PHILOSOPHY to get 33% off all future technology. For serenity with a hint of spice, join IMO. Subject to terms and conditions, parallel resources not included. Altar of Peace offer is null and void if you attack before turn 5. Side effects include hair loss, llama bites, boredom, and rage quits. Mindbenders are not a substitute for licensed healthcare providers. For serenity with a hint of spice, join IMO. On smaller maps or FFAs, the goal is to get a giant as soon as possible because that's what other tribes have a hard time dealing with. If you're lucky enough to get lots of similar resources around your capital and you decide to rush a giant, don't get a second warrior or philosophy. Although Imo's giant potential isn't as great as T0 tribes, the monument gives a big advantage to grow a city to level 5 early. The idea is to get a giant at around turn 5 or 6 using the monument and avoiding the second warrior to get that giant faster. You may end up with less cities because you don't get that second warrior, but the giant and park of fortune may outweigh that. The downside of giant rush is that you usually need forestry and lumber huts and they cost three stars now. You can still get a giant on T5, but you need really good resources to pull it off. IMO has a 150% mountain spawn rate. So odds are, if you play IMO enough, you'll get a spawn with lots of mountains. Let's look at a scenario where climbing makes sense as a first tech. If you find a ruin on a mountain, that seals the deal. Go for climbing. You can get climbing on turn one or turn two whenever you realize you need it. Then, on turn four, you can afford to pick up mining before capturing that first village. Here, I meet an opponent on turn five and can use the stars to upgrade. But if you don't meet an opponent or get stars from a ruin, you would place the monument on turn five in the city where you can get a mine later to get the five star rebate. Early climbing will also make your exploration more efficient on average IMO terrain as IMO seems to have more empty tiles than other tribes while also having more mountains which block the path to villages. A note about farming. IMO has almost no farms. With many other tribes, it might make sense to pick up organization early because it's expected that there's some farms on empty tiles, but for IMO that is not the case. On this entire map, there are only two tiles of farms. If you have a choice, pick some other tech like hunting or mining to upgrade your cities in the early game. Once you meet an opponent, it's time to go for riding or archers. Riders are good for open terrain where you have vision, but they're stopped by mountains or forest tiles without roads. If you have hunting already, archers can be very useful in the mid game. Here I have philosophy on turn six and see my opponent. I decide to go for archery. I know I can use one archer in combination with two warriors to siege one of the cities. I'm not sure which one to attack, so I move in for more vision. I see the swordsman in the south city and choose to attack the middle city, first with the archer, then with the two warriors. I continue to attack, keeping my archers at a safe distance and putting my warriors on the forest tiles for the defense bonus. Even though he has a swordsman, I'm able to whittle it down with my archers. 
Eventually he gets a giant, but it's too late. I already have the advantage. On water maps like continents, do not get riding or archery. Go for sailing. Place ports that connect your capital and upgrade your cities on the coast. Put warriors in rafts to explore. Get fishing to upgrade more cities and get scouts for vision. With water maps, you want to get on the water first and expand fast. If you have a lot of mountains and go into the climbing tech branch, getting mining and smithery in the mid game can get you lots of giants. Here, the black player gets philosophy for 13 stars. Then he invests in mines to upgrade his cities. On turn 11, Thanks to well-placed forges and a lighthouse, he has three giants. Because this is a lakes map, he gets on the water and makes juggernauts. By turn 16, he has six giants. He's able to siege and keep two of his opponent's cities. Black continues to put pressure on his opponent in the water, eventually winning. Okay, let's get to the part you've all been waiting for. How to use mind benders. The most basic way to use a mind bender is defensively. Here, the mind bender discourages the giant from moving in or attacking the warrior because it would get converted. The best way to pull this off is to place the mind bender in the fog. Be sure your opponent doesn't have vision. That way, they can't see the mind bender waiting. You can also place the Mindbender behind your city so that if an enemy unit sieges, you can convert it. Another classic way to use a Mindbender is to push with a giant or a polytar and convert an opponent. Sometimes this is called stealing units. This works because Mindbenders do not have the dash ability. They cannot move and convert on the same turn. However, if a Mindbender's move is a force push from another unit, it still has that attack available on their turn. It takes planning, though you need to be careful of push order. For more information about push order, watch our movement guide. A link is in the description. Here, a giant is coming from the northwest. This is a newly created Mindbender. A giant will push it towards the middle of the map and away from the oncoming threat. So, if you see a threat coming towards a city that can pop a giant the following turn and go the direction you need it to, get a mind bender. Be ready to push. When it works, it is so satisfying. Another way to use mind benders is healing. This can work well for naval units offshore, especially for bombers. Mindbenders as healers can pair nicely with riders. In this game, not only does Umaji place a mindbender next to the sieging barter giant, he uses some other mindbenders to heal his riders. After they attack, the riders bounce back to the healers. However, mindbenders are easy to counter. Riders are great for countering them, as well as any ranged units, like archers or scouts in the water. If you have a giant coming up to siege an Imo city with a tile of fog, have a couple units within range standing by, just in case you find a mindbender lying in wait. Because mindbenders rely on the element of surprise, you must be able to predict what your opponents can or cannot see. You have to remember where their units have been and need to see if they bought explorers. Here is an example of a double mindbender trap in a 2v2 and how to counter it. Chin Chi is teamed up with Illyrion here, and Imo is allied with Yadak. On turn 8, Imo decides to get a mindbender in this city on the coast. Then, next turn, Chin Chi gets a swordsman from the ruin. Now notice, Chin Chi cannot see the Imo city and that mindbender in the fog. Neither can their ally, Illyrian. 
Remember, mind benders are most effective when they are hidden in the fog and have that element of surprise. So Imo decides to double down and get a second mind bender. On turn 10, Chinchi goes for the Imo city, first with the rider, then with the swordsman. The swordsman uncovers the two mind benders. Now, Chinchi and Illyrian are faced with a dilemma how to counter the mind benders, take the city, and not lose that precious Chinchi swordsman turned against them. They make a plan. This five hit point Illyrian warrior actually has two kills already. One more kill will make it a veteran. So Illyria moves the five hit point warrior next to the city to uncover the fog and reveal the mind bender. Then the archer shoots, letting the warrior do the kill and sieging the city, becoming a veteran. Now they did this on purpose. They chose to siege with the warrior because they expected the mind bender to convert the unit that was sieging the city instead of the swordsman. Although the swordsman got one hit from the Imo archer, it gets a chance to attack the next turn. Before Imo gets a turn to use that mind bender to convert again, the Illyrian archer moves in and finishes off the mind bender, effectively countering that double mind bender setup. Before we end, I need to send a huge thanks to these players for their help with this strategy guide. Okay, thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe, it helps us a lot. What kinds of strategy guides do you want to see next? Let us know in the comments. Join our Discord! The link to the Discord server is in the description. Take care, see you on the next one.